morning. Great to see you here this morning. Those of you that I can see, because these lights keep me so I, that's why the people hide in the back seats. If they're scared to death, I'll use their names. We're in Mark chapter 12 this morning. If you'd be turning there, please, Mark's Gospel chapter 12. And we're looking with the title, So Many Questions, which we started on last week. And uh, when we finished the message up, we were looking at love for God. Loving God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all of our strength. And I want to come back to that this morning. As we looked at in this chapter so far, we've been looking at the many questions. There are questions where they question Jesus about his authority, his right, even though he's Lord of Lords and King of Kings. They questioned his authority. They continued to question him, as we saw last week, about government and taxes. Do we have to pay taxes and all of that? There's a question in between that we're going to come back to about the resurrection. And then this morning we're looking at what is the greatest commandment? What's the greatest commandment? The one that, that we ought to be paying the greatest attention to, if it's the greatest. And uh, are we living that out in our lives? So, do some house cleaning here. Let's uh, look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for your precious word that we'll be able to read in a moment. Thank you that you've allowed us to gather here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for uh, some new faces that I've seen here with us. We pray that they would all feel very welcome. We pray that your spirit would challenge all of us, Lord, with a truth that's before us today. I praise your servant. Fill me with your precious Holy Spirit. God, these people have come with an expectation to hear from you. And that can only happen, Lord, as you fill me. Use me as a tool in your hand. Let me be your voice today. But Lord, let it be your word that finds a home in our hearts, that begins, Lord, to further transform us into the likeness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for these songs we've been able to sing. Lord, 10,000 reasons. Thinking, Lord, about the greatness of your love for us and the joy that you give us. Lord, help us honor you with our hearts in this place now as we listen to your word. We think of some, Lord, that because of illness are not able to be with us, some of the hospital, think of many today, think of Paul that we've been praying so much for. May they sense your presence and your work in their hearts. Lord, we, we know that there's some in nursing homes today. May they know your presence. May, Lord, they be encouraged by it. Maybe a family member today, someone that would come and sit and read a passion portion of Scripture with them, a word of prayer. But, Lord, let them become very, very aware that you care about them and know your touch and your hand upon their lives. Thank you, Lord, for this birth for Kendrick and Simone. Lord, we pray that they'd be able to raise this young man to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, and to walk before you in the power of your Spirit as well. Lord, now, as we turn our attention here to your truth, help us to realize it is your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. When we think about loving God, the question here, and I... Uh, Somebody visited me while I was praying. <laughs> Sinful people. <laughs> Micah and Johanna are here somewhere. I haven't seen them. Oh, they're back over here. So make sure that you get to greet them before they get out of here. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Uh, and it's good to be reminded of those things, isn't it? Mike is a former pastor here, and his wife, and their children, and it's a joy to have them in our midst. Now, if I get my mind back here to the passage, we're just going to begin to read in verse, verse 28, for time's sake this morning, verse 28, 
And it says, then one of the scribes. So they would had the Pharisees and the Herodians who were always born enemies, but they'd gotten together because they want to trap Jesus. They didn't have any good intent. They didn't really want to know what Jesus had to say. They just wanted to get him in trouble. And then the Sadducees come when they saw that the Pharisees and Sadducees had failed, and they had their question about the resurrection, and they tell their little story that we'll come back to uh, another Sunday morning here. And uh, Jesus rebukes them and tells them, you you do err because you don't know the scriptures. You imagine what a slap in in the face it would be, uh, you know, to to walk up to your pastor, you don't know the scriptures, you're in error. Uh, That's what he was literally saying to them. And then there's a scribe who's there. He's, they're sort of the, the theologians of the crew, the seminary guys and uh, lawyers as well, not only the, the Herodians, but they, they were. And it says, and one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him. Now, perceiving that he'd answered them well means this. He comes with an honest question. The others were just trying to get Jesus in trouble. But he's kind of amazed at the answers that Jesus has been giving. He realizes that they're great answers, they're true answers. And he's got a question in his head that he wants to ask. And that question is this. He's, he's, it says he asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Now, How many of you know in the Bible, what's the first commandment? No, it's don't eat of the fruit. And I only point that out to you because when he says first here, he's not saying which is the first one in the Bible. He's saying which is the first one in in matter of importance, in matter of priority for your life. Which one should you be most concerned about here? So he says, which is the first commandment of all? And you remember they had 613 of them. I think it was 248 were negative and 365 that were positive or the other way around. And they chose the 365 because they needed one for every day of the year, they said. I mean, really kind of stupid things when you stop and think about it all. But Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth. For there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. We would assume when we walk through the doors of this place, that we're here because we what? Come on, folks. We love God, right? We're here to worship him because we love him. At least that should be very foremost in our hearts and our minds that we love God. Now, let's be honest. There isn't anybody here that loves him perfectly. We all love him imperfectly, don't we? But we're looking forward and we're building towards that great day when we're in his presence and we will love him perfectly. But he says, this is a command for us today and it's a command. It's not something that we can ignore. It's not, uh, you know, uh, if you ever get around to it, you, you should love God. <laughs> if there's some day you wake up and you're feeling like it, you should maybe love God that day. No, this is a command from God to love him. And I want to just point out here, I'm not trying to be hard-hearted with this, but this is a command, a universal command to the entire human race. And disobedience to this command 
will cause a man to spend eternity in a place called hell. If we don't love God the way that we ought to love God. And the world is full of people who have refused to love God and to follow God and to listen to God. This, Jesus says, God manifest in the flesh tells us, this is the consummate commandment that we must obey. Nothing is as critical of all the things God told us to do as this command to love the Lord our God as far-reaching implications for us. Matter of fact, it has eternal implications for us. The first commandment is to love the Lord our God, and he is one. That, by the way, is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, or you can read verses 1 through 5 to check that out if you like. And then he throws in, and what's interesting is that no scribe, no Pharisee, nobody, as far as we can find out in, in, in history and what's been written, ever linked together these two commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second, which is like it, is what? Love your neighbor as yourself. What's he trying to say there? There's no use saying you love God if you don't love your neighbor. If you don't care and have a burden for your neighbor, your neighbor could be your wife, could be your children, could be their grandparents, could be your in-laws. But bottom line is, your neighbor is anybody that you come across who has a need. <laughs> Remember the story of the Good Samaritan. He met somebody who was in need that was his enemy. And by the way, God does say something about love your what? Love your enemies. And we're to love them wholeheartedly. Love them as we love ourselves. Love him. And this man looks back at Jesus and says, Look, that's right, teacher, well said, well done. He applauds Jesus for it. And when Jesus saw, it says that he, he answered him wisely, that the, the Pharisees or the scribes' responses was a good response. He looks at him, I think, very intently and said this, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now you'd assume that's a good thing to say, wouldn't you, Dieter? It's, you're not far from God. But there's a problem with that. Is that you're not far, but you are what? You're still not with God. You're not in God. You might be near to putting your faith in Christ, but until you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, what? You might as well be a thousand miles away or a million miles away. Not far. And I want you to remember that. It's not good enough. Then he goes, we want to draw our attention here to what he's, he's talking about in this, this particular passage. By the way, in Matthew's gospel, chapter 23, there's a statement there where Jesus looks at the scribes and the Pharisees and he says, Woe unto you, you bunch of hypocrites! It would be a great way for a preacher to start his message every Sunday morning, wouldn't it? He says, you bunch of hypocrites. And this is what he says. You tithe of tiny little seeds like dill and mint and cumin. And then he says this, but you ignore the weightier matters of the law. Now, I remember I had a teacher in Bible school that said over and over and over, doesn't matter, you know, what the commandment is, what, what it says. They're all equal if you break one. You know, and I understand if you break the commandment of God, in one point you're guilty of all. But Jesus says very clearly that there are some commandments that carry more what? More weight. More weight. Than whether you take a few seeds out of a pot and throw them over here and tie them to God. Or what? Or you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And... You love your neighbor as yourself because you can't separate those two anymore because Jesus put them together. 
That's our responsibility. That's the weightier matter of the law. What he's saying there, if it's weightier, it takes a little more priority in your life. If my wife says to me, here's a list I got for you uh, tomorrow morning. It's Monday, my day off, and here's what I want you to do. But then she says, the ones that have the, the, the red mark beside them, those are the ones you must do. All right, she's saying those are the priorities. You don't get those done, you're going to spend the day in the doghouse. <laughs> God says there's some weightier things that we need to do in listening to the law. And now we know what that weightier thing is, don't we? Is loving the Lord our God and loving our neighbor as ourselves. As I said, that's found back in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 6. By the way, Deuteronomy literally means the second law. It was the second time that Moses came and just laid it all out for them. And there's 30-some chapters. And he takes it just before he's going to die. And then Joshua's going to lead them into the promised land and lays the law out before them. And he just begs them, listen, this is God's commands. And if you'll do it, God will give you rain. And if you do this, God will give you houses. And if you do this, God's going to bless you. And if you do this, he's going to give you more cities. He just says, if you do this, and I got to be honest, I, I never noticed before <laughs> how many times in the book of Deuteronomy it says this, if you love God. You ought to read through Deuteronomy. I'm going to tell you, there won't be some dry spots, but you ought to read through Deuteronomy and it's just to notice and check off how many times God says, love the Lord your God. This is what's called by the Hebrews the Shema. And they would take this verse of scripture and put it in little square boxes with a band and wear it around their heads because they wanted everybody to know, right? And sometimes they would have one of these little boxes they'd put on their wrist. And they'd walk around so that people could see, you know, hey, we're really spiritual people. We're holy. We, we got God's commandment here to love the Lord our God on us. But what Jesus is going to, to drive home here with these people is that this isn't about an external thing stamped on your forehead or on your wrist somewhere. This is something that has to be where it has to be in your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. It's not about externals. It's not about all the good things that you can do. It's not about helping little old ladies across the street. It's about loving the Lord your God and loving others the same way you, uh, you love yourself. And we all love ourselves. You're never going to be obedient to this commandment as long as you keep it a matter of externals. Well, Lord, you should know I love you. I showed up to church this morning. No, no. It's more than that. It's got to be what? In here. In here. The hunger to know God, to grow in Christ. It has to be eternal. He says, the Lord is one. That is, he's the one true God. There were there are a multitude of gods in Israel from all the different tribes that had been there before they, they landed there, gods in Rome and gods in this place and gods in Babylon and so on and so forth. But he said, the only one you need to worry about is this one, <laughs> the living God. Don't worry about this God, Venus, or this God over here, or this God back there. You just worry about this one because he's really the only one. There's only one God, and loving him is the foundation for your walk as a Christian, your life as a Christian. The Lord is one. He's the only God, and you need to love him like he's the only God. You need to love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength and energy, all a priority. In other words, with all your capacities, with all that you are. I think I asked you this question last week, but I want to come back to it. Do you love God? How much do you love God? Would you say 10%, 20%, 50%, 90%? All of them come what? They come short. They come short. 
So we ought to want to learn, how can I love God more with all my capacity? And by the way, the word there is agapeo, which comes from the word agape, which is what? That's God's kind of love. That's the highest kind of love, supreme love. Using all your capacity, she says, love God with your intelligence, love God with your will, love God with your purpose, love God with your choices, love God with your sacrifice, love God with your obedience. He's not saying there, love God with phileo love. That's brotherly love or, or literally love that comes from attraction. You know, the first time I met my wife, I loved her because I was attracted to her. But you think she would have settled for marrying me with that kind of love? No, she wanted a little deeper kind of love, don't you think? God says, I want your deepest love. I want agape love, the love of God. To love me, not just to be attracted to me because I've done something for you, you know, like when he fed the 5,000 or he healed a blind man, but because of who God is. Do you know who he is? We sang some wonderful things about him this morning, about who he is, how great God is. It shouldn't be hard for us to come up with 10,000 reasons, right? To sing and praise God for who he is. Love God with your affections. Love him with your emotions. But it's got to be more than those things. Begins with the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods, what? Before me. Don't, don't bring any other God into the picture. Love God for who he is. Love him for what he's done. And do it with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. What's it mean to love God with your heart? Your heart is literally the core of who you are, the very core and center of your being. We sometimes speak of we ought to set God on the throne of our what? Of our heart. That's exactly what we need to do. We're not talking about the little organ in there that pumps blood through our body. But this is a core of your being. Love God with all your heart, with all your identity, with all the, that you are. Your, your heart, out of the heart come our heart, apart from Christ. What, what comes out of that heart? Great wickedness. Murders and adulteries and fornications and thefts and covetousness and all kinds of wicked things. But God wants a heart that what? Doesn't love those things, it loves him. A heart that's given over to God. Proverbs 4.23 warns us, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the what? The issues of life. He wants us to love him with a guarded heart, a protected heart, from what we let into it. If you sit mindlessly in front of your television every night, I want you to know you haven't got a guarded heart. <laughs> You've got to guard that heart. You've got to think about what's there. Somebody comes on there and starts swearing at me. Listen, if, Dieter, if you come into my house and you're sitting there swearing, I'm going to put you out. I'm not going to let him sit there and swear. You know, if I got young kids around and stuff, he wouldn't let me in his house to swear at his kids, would you? No, not going to happen. So why do we let an idiot box do it? Right? We, we need to guard our, our hearts. And yes, guard our minds, but keep it with all diligence. He says, for out of it are the issues of life. The greatest issue of life, do you love God? Do you love God? Does it help you to love God? If you're involved in that thing, your soul John MacArthur says the soul is your emotions. I think it's more than that, to be honest, but I think he's right. It is, has to do with our emotions, and, and, and I guess feelings would be associated with that. But uh, to love God with all our soul. God breathed into man and made him what? A living creature. It means with your life. With the foundation of your life, you love God. With, with everything that's within you. And yes, do it with emotion. We ought to sing with emotion, shouldn't we? I like it when I look around. Sometimes there's people with their hands upraised as we're singing. And, you know, we ought to involve these bodies. That's one of the other things he talks about here. We ought to love them with our strength and, and, and physically love God in every way that we can. Love them with our minds. We, we need to love God with our minds. You ever stop and think about that? Do you ever sit down someday and just think of, you know what, I want to love God with my mind today. How would I do that? 
I'd do that by thinking about him, wouldn't I? Maybe I'd read some scripture to put scripture into my mind and to, to make me think about God, to help me think about God. But with our, our will. I have made up my what? Mind. What have I said? I've made a choice. I've made a decision. This is my will. This is what I'm going to do. So your mind has to do with your will, with making choices before God. So I want my mind to love God so that when I make a decision, I want to make sure it shows God that I love him by what I did. Bringing that constantly before the Lord. Love God with your strength, with, with your physical energy. Love the Lord. It, it has to do with, I think, all of our activities, the things, that we, whatever we do in our bodies. Ought to be things that show that we love God. That might mean taking my granddaughter and pulling her in a wagon down the sidewalk, right? That could be a way of showing God I love him because I love my kids. And we're called to love our families and, and all of those things. So but we need to think about using our energies to show love for God. It's an active love. It's an all-consuming love that touches every part of our being. All our soul, all our heart, all our mind, all our strength. I want to say something to you. I want you to get. God has loved us. And he's loved us how? He's loved us graciously. He's loved us abundantly. Has he not? With all of his heart. For God so loved the world. And that means this. That a half-hearted love from you back to God is not sufficient. It calls for a whole-hearted love of God. With everything that we can put into this loving God. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, he talks about love the Lord your God. In Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 13, uh, Moses again says, You shall therefore love the Lord your God and always keep his charge, his statutes, his ordinance, and his commandments. He says, if you do that, it will come about, if you listen obediently to my commands, which I'm commanding you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart, all your soul, so forth, you will receive rain. So you want the rains to come for your gardens? You need to what? You need to love God. Whoever would have thought that it would depend on my loving God? Verse 22, it says, if you are careful to keep all this commandment, which I'm commanding you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and hold fast to him, the Lord will drive out the nations who are your enemies. Want to get rid of your enemies? Love God. In chapter 13 of Deuteronomy, he says, you shall not listen to the words of a false prophet or a dreamer of dreams. Don't even listen to them. Don't turn on your TV. Don't let them preach to you. Turn them off. He says, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if what? If you love the Lord your God. The kind of preachers you listen to will determine before God. He'll know whether you love God or you don't love God. That's what he says. Love God with all your heart and with all your soul. Chapter 19, verse 9, he says, If you carefully observe all this commandment which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to walk in his ways always, then you shall add three more cities for yourself. You're going you're gonna to get more abundance is what he's saying. God's going to bless you for that. Deuteronomy chapter 30 in verse 6, he says, The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to what? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so that you may live. You want to live? <laughs> love God. Verse 16, In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, that you may live and multiply. I don't know about you, but I never realized there were that many verses in Deuteronomy that talked about our, the command to love God. God. I doubt there's another commandment that he repeats that often. So it's important to God that we learn to love God. And the Pharisees and the Herodians and the scribes that had come to Jesus, listen, they were the most religious people in the land. They were the religious leaders, but they were nowhere near to this. Because Jesus will expose them that you only love yourselves. You don't love God. And so we need to let God speak to our hearts and examine us today and 
answer the question, do we love God? Because there's only two classes of people. Heard one old preacher say, the saints and the ain'ts. (laughs) I'll put it this way, those who love God and those who don't. Those who love God truly and those that don't love God truly. They may look it, may put it on appearance at church, they may look very pious, but the important thing is what? It's the heart. Do I love God? Psalm 69, 36 says, the descendants of his servants will inherit it, that is the promised blessing, and those who love his name will dwell in it. Those who what? Who love his name, they're going to get to dwell in the inheritance, in the land. The land for us is heaven. We're going to get to dwell in heaven if we love God. Follow him. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 says, Just as it is written, taken from the book of Isaiah, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who, guess what? All those who love him, who love God. That's the promise that he's making to us. What I'm trying to say to you this morning is that what defines you as a follower of Christ, as a believer in God, is that you must what? You must love God. It's not because you walked an aisle and prayed a prayer or anything. It's what came of that? Do you love God? It doesn't mean that on day one you you had all this tremendous love and understood everything, no. But listen, you ought to be continually being what? Challenged and transformed. Bob Dunlop back here is a hero to many of you. He's a hero to me as a walk, somebody who's walked with God. But Bob would tell you today he's got to keep growing in his 90th year, in his 91st, in his 92nd, if he makes it, what, to 190, whatever. We've got to keep growing in our love for God. Make it a passionate pursuit to obey this first and greatest commandment. How in the world are we going to do that? How are, how are we going to love God the way we ought to? How are we going to love our neighbor the way we should love our neighbor? Whenever God gives us command, he always gives us what? The resources and whatever we need to fulfill that commandment. What has God given us to fulfill this commandment to love God the way that we ought to love God? I will say this, one of the ways you can judge whether you love God is by way of your commitment. Hang on to that word. Your commitment to God. Your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember hearing a song years ago. I think it was by Philip, Craig, and Dean. Some of you won't even remember them. But there was a question there that says, will you love Jesus more? I hope, I've been here almost 15 years, if I get to stay a few more, that'd be great, but I hope when I leave here, the goal of my life is this, that you will be able to say that I love Jesus more since Pastor Woodcock came here. It's something that would bless my heart, would bless the heart of God if you love him more, because it's the great commandment, love Jesus more. In John chapter 4, the Bible tells us that Jesus seeketh such. He seeks these kind of people to what? To worship him. Worship him in loving hearts before the Lord with the love of God. It means investing your entire life. Thinking about it every day. How can I love God today? I stop myself every day. Most mornings I get up. I put on my spiritual armor, I take a shower, and then I start to head down to get my breakfast. And I look back at my wife laying there in the bed. And no, I don't say she ought to get up and get my breakfast. I wasn't. 
I prefer to get my own, to be honest. It gives me time to think. But I stop by our door and I always say a little prayer. And one of the things I say when I pray is, Lord, would you help me to find a way to show her that I love her today? Should we do that with God? God, you help me to find a way to show you that I love you today with my heart, with my soul, with my mind, with my strength, Lord. I ask this question to myself, why does God have to give us this commandment? Frankly, because we don't do very good at it. We don't do well with loving God. Israel, God did all those great things for them, delivered them from Egypt and everything else. And the very next generation, what? They forgot all about God. So we're not good at this thing. And what we're starting this morning, we're going we're gonna to be here for a, probably another three Sundays. I want to talk to you about building an all-out love for God. We're talking this morning mainly, we're going to talk about the heart. Then I want to talk about the soul. And then the mind. And then with all your strength. With your body. Loving the Lord. Just try to wake us up to the most important thing in our lives. What it means to love God. Loving God seems to me in one way is not enough. If I love him with all my heart, but I don't love him with my soul, don't love him with my mind, don't love him with, have I fulfilled the commandment? No. So I want us to look at all of these things. And now, when I say that, somebody's going to interrupt and say, yeah, but they're all interconnected. Yes, they are. <laughs> yes, they are. We talk about the soul being the seat of emotions, but so is your heart, isn't it? Somebody says he wears his emotions on his sleeve. They're generally talking about their heart. What's in their heart? And, and we have to understand this. Before I jump any further into this, I just want to say you need to be forewarned about some things. Forewarned. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, verse 4, In the last days perilous times will come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. They're going to be covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Would you say we've arrived there? Seems to me like we're in the last days. It says all those things, and it says lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Big boys and big what? Big toys. That's the generation we live in. But Christians are called to stand apart from the world and we're to set a different kind of quality of life, are we not? We're to be different in this world. You know what it also says there? It says, the love of many will what? Will wax cold. The love of many will wax cold. And the danger is, even for Christians, if you're not careful, if you don't work at this, your love can wax cold towards the things of God towards gathering together to worship him with God's people. Isaiah 29, 13 says, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips to honor me, but have removed their heart far from me. So what's he saying? We could all be here today. We could open our mouths and sing. We could raise our hands, you know. But what? But the heart could be a long ways away from God this morning. And we want to crack that. We want you to take up the challenge to love God. Mark chapter 7 verse 21 says, For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, murders, thefts, covetous, fornication, wickedness, deceit. And there's a few more. <laughs> it's a dirty place to be in, in some hearts, isn't it? That's the human heart apart from Christ. It's the heart that the Pharisees had. The real problem with the Pharisees wasn't the externals. They were doing pretty good with that. But it was the internals. They didn't love God. And it tells us this. That God does in fact examine our hearts. That's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? <laughs> Every day God's examining our hearts to see if we love him with all of our heart. If we've given our hearts over to the Lord. 
Not thinking about it won't solve the problem. So think about it. Uh, there's a statement made about David in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. It says this, God looks not on the outward appearance, but upon the what? The heart. God looks at it. In every man, not just David. He looks at the heart to see what's going on in the heart of man. Revelation 3.20 talks about a church there in Laodicea. It was called the what church? The lukewarm church. They were neither hot nor cold. They weren't hot for God. They weren't necessarily cold for God. Kind of a middle. And God wasn't happy with that church. He said, I'd like to what? Spew them out of my mouth. I don't want Devon Park to be that kind of a church. I want us to be made up of people that genuinely love God with all of our hearts and lift up the Lord. I remember preaching 10, 12 years ago (laughs) after a Christmas presentation, uh, sharing a message called, Are You a Fan or a Follower? (laughs) Are we just fans of Jesus or are we followers of Jesus? You say, what's, what's that got to do with this, a fan or a follower? Churches in North America in particular are becoming much more adept at drawing fans to Jesus than followers. Because we want to attract them with the things that they like. We want to give them the music they like. We, we don't want to talk about sin, so we won't talk about sin from the pulpit anymore. You can tell we're, we're, we're very much like that. Seeker sensitive. And I applaud them that they want to reach the lost people. But trying to make Jesus appealing, comfortable to follow, convenient, as possible in their lives... A fan, listen, is an enthusiastic admirer of somebody or a team. We can get into that in sports, right? Any sports fans here? Any Maple Leaf fans? <laughs> I didn't see who won the game last night, so I didn't know whether you'd be ashamed to raise your hand or not. We have fans. What do fans do? Fans go into the stands in the arena or... In a football, you know, where are they? They're not on the field, they're in the stands. What we're calling for here is for you not to just be a fan of Jesus, but what? Let's get down on the playing field. Let's learn how to play the game and the power of Jesus Christ, the fullness of His Spirit, and become actively involved in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead of our churches being sanctuaries, they become stadiums. To make people feel comfortable. And the sad thing is they can get so comfortable they can be lost and go to hell. I don't want that to happen from Devon Park. I want them to hear the message of God's word. How does Jesus define following him? Did he seem to make it easy? Convenient? Follow me when it's convenient? No, he says what you got to do is you... You're getting tired of me saying this, aren't you? Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And that's costly. It involves sacrifice. It'll involve some pain along the way to follow Jesus. I remember in John chapter 3, a story there by, uh, about a guy named Nicodemus. He was one of the Pharisees. And he'd been hearing about Jesus, got kind of interested in Jesus, And he goes and he seeks out Jesus. Do you remember what time of day it was when he sought out Jesus? In the night. Now why in the world do you suppose he came to Jesus at night? Didn't want anybody to see it. So it's got to be comfortable when I feel comfortable to approach him and, and make it easy and all of this. He'd watch Jesus do some incredible things, the perform miracles. He'd heard some of the impressive things that he taught. He'd seen the compassion and love of the Lord Jesus. And it seems like the thought occurred to him, I need to take my relationship with him to another level. Not just that I'm out here listening to him and all of this. But it wasn't an easy journey. He had a lot to lose. He could 
possibly lose his family. You know, they'd reject him if he decided to become a follower of Christ. He'd lose all his buddies. What in the world would the other Pharisees and scribes and so on say about him if he decides to follow Jesus? If they ever found out that Nicodemus was even an admirer of this carpenter from Nazareth, he'd be in deep trouble. It would cost him. But being a secret admirer of Jesus would cost you how much? Nothing. Except maybe your soul and eternity. Cost them nothing. Followers of Christ pay a price. You're going to play on the field, skate on the ice with the team. You got to get out there and get in shape. You got to work and exercise and everything that's part of that. You got to get the skills down. Are we willing to do that as Christians? Or would we rather just let the preacher get up and talk and then go home and have the rest of the week to ourselves? Nicodemus finds himself at what would seem like a real crossroads in his life. He's going to have to choose between his religion and a relationship with Jesus. What choice will he make? There was no way that he could truly become a follower of Jesus Christ, listen, without losing his religion. That had to happen in my life. I had to lose the religion that I had growing up. And I knew I had to set it apart and depend totally, truly, and fully upon Christ. I abandoned all my self-efforts to save myself and trusted Christ. Nicodemus is going to have to do that. You know how he knew that? Because Jesus came to him and he said, uh, Nicodemus, I've got to tell you something. You must be born. It's got to be a radical change in your life. You've got to drop all that stuff and start all over in following Christ, giving him your life. There was no way that he could begin a relationship with Christ without that impacting his life, his job, his family, everything that he did. And I'm going to be honest with you today. If you give your heart and life to Jesus Christ... It will have to impact your family. It will have to impact your job and the people that you work with. It will have to impact the, the, the people that you play sports with and, and, and all those things in your life. There's a pastor I heard speak in, in uh, Toronto at a fellowship conference many, many years ago. His name was John Oros, if I remember his last name correctly. He was a pastor from Romania, communist country at that time. He said... At that conference, he said, when people in Romania repent, that's what they call getting saved. They don't just say, you know, trusted Christ. They say he repented. He repented. He said they would repent and they'd want to join our church. And he said, we would tell them, well, before that, you have to take three months of classes. I know you're going to say, oh, I, that, that shouldn't be. But he says, during that three months of classes... We teach them at every class, if you choose to follow Christ, you can lose. And you can lose big time. You can lose your home. You can lose your job. You can lose your family. You can lose your life. He said, we want to make it very, very clear that what? There will be a cost to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Because what? Being a follower is totally different than being a fan. Yeah, we've got some disappointment as a flea fans over the years. But it didn't take my life. But being a follower of Christ will cost you everything. So the question I raise for you this morning, has your following Jesus Christ cost you anything? That's a fair question, isn't it? Has your following of Christ cost you anything? Does it cost you any of your time? Does it cost you comments from the people you work with, you know, when they find out that you're a follower of Christ? Has it cost you anything to be a follower of Christ? How has following Christ interfered with your life? Is it any different than it would have been without Christ, aside from showing up on Sunday morning once a week to nod at Jesus? 
Now, what happened with Nicodemus? Well, we don't know in John chapter 3, but later on, he's in a meeting with the Pharisees and scribes, and they're talking about what they're going to do with Jesus. And it tells us that Nicodemus was at a crossroads there because he has to decide, will I say anything or will I not? And during that situation in his life, (laughs) I'm so happy to say that Nicodemus spoke up and he said, should we condemn a man before we know who he is and what he's really saying? Remember that? And do you remember what came back at him? You also from Galilee. And that was a real slap in the face back then. You know, it's like saying, are you from Cross Creek, New Brunswick? Spencer? (laughs) Are we prepared to suffer anything to follow Jesus? You know, it says in Luke chapter 14, I, I won't go there to read all these verses, but it says, three times, you cannot be my disciple. You can't be my disciple if you don't hate your father and mother and brother and sister and your in-laws. And well, Some of you say, oh, I don't have a problem with that. But you know what he's saying here. And when he's talking about it, he says, you don't have to hate your father and mother, but you'll love Jesus so much that they'll almost think you hate them because you're so committed to Christ and following him. He says, whosoever doesn't hate cannot be my disciple. He also says this, he says, if you're not willing to take up your cross and bear your cross, you can't what? You can't be my disciple. He says, whosoever, now listen, this is tough. Whosoever does not forsake all that he has can't be my disciple. Have you forsaken? Would you be willing to forsake all that you have to follow Christ? If God tapped you on the shoulder today and says, you know what, I I, I think this coming fall, I want you to go to Brunswick Bible Institute and spend a year or three years or whatever and prepare for ministry, and would we be willing to do that? You know the amazing thing about all this? When Jesus is talking about following me, he says a number of times, you ought to count the cost. And what I like is he doesn't put it down here in the fine print that you can hardly see, like some of those legal documents that people give you. This is in large print for all of us to see. And he's trying to make us aware of it this morning. You say, well, preacher, I I made a decision for Christ, but is there evidence that you're following Christ? Because a decision, quote, decision, will always be followed if it's a genuine decision with a changed life. With growth in Christ, with a love for the word, a love for God, a love to pray, and to be with God. To be a fan is just that you admire somebody. To be a follower of Christ, and he doesn't offer us any other option but following means more than most people think. I want you to put it this way. Think of these terms. It's an awful illustration. Imagine going to a wedding, and you watch the groom on the wedding day, and he's dressed in his finest suit. You see the bride in her gown come down the aisle and stands up at the front before the preacher, and then this, this groom makes this great speech about his devotion to his bride, forsaking all others until death do us part. And you listen to those words and think, wow, that's a commitment. He's made a decision to marry this woman. But imagine... That a few weeks later, we find out that while he was on his honeymoon, he actually broke all those commitments and had relations with another woman or several women. 
you'd realize that all those words that he said in making that decision didn't mean what? They didn't mean anything. Because he hadn't kept them. He hadn't followed it up by proving that in the relationship. And God is telling us here in, that you as believers need to love the Lord your God with all your heart. That this needs to go beyond a decision to literally following the Lord. It, it, it involves a commitment of your life to Christ, giving Him everything, serving Him, no turning back. I'm going to follow Jesus. There's also another danger talked about in Ephesians chapter 2. He writes to the church at Ephesus and said, you know, i got to talk to you. You're doing the works. You're doing all this. But you have left something. Anybody know what it was? You have left your first love. That might be what God's trying to tackle you with this morning, with his words. Say, have you left your first love? God chose David because he said David was a man after what? After God's own heart. Can you say this morning, I'm a man after God's heart. And yes, David did some horrible sins, didn't he? Had some awful weaknesses in his life. But you know why God could use him? Because he has a heart for God. I'm asking you this morning, do you have a heart for God? Are you a man after God's own heart? And we're going to be talking over these next few weeks about do you have this heart for God? A heart filled with a commitment and compelling passion to follow Christ at the very core of your being. Do you have a mind, your your intellect that's focused on God? A will that's bent. Jesus said, I have come to do what? The will of him who sent me. That's got to be our heart. With all of our soul. By the way, the word soul often is interspersed with the word, what? Spirit. (laughs) With all of your spirit serving the Lord. The spirit that's been made alive through Christ. With all your strength and all your energy. Understand this. Nobody can sing for God like you. Nobody can witness for God like you. Why? Because you're a unique individual. And God wants you to use all of that for his glory. You say, well, I'm struggling with my mind right now. Well, Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says you need to get busy doing what? Renewing your mind. How? Through the scriptures, through the word of God. Start memorizing it, studying it, thinking about it every day. Grab a verse in the morning and take with you to work. Whatever it is to get this on your mind and to guard your mind. Because giving God half your mind is not an option. He wants all your mind. He wants all your heart. He wants all these things that we've been talking about. He wants all your strength. I wrote here, God loves the smell of your sweat. If you're serving him, you're using your energy to serve God then God loves that. He doesn't want you sitting in the arena. He wants you on the ice. He wants you on the football field. He wants you serving the Lord. I was reading some stuff here about heart transplants, and I'm not going to bother getting all through that, but I do want to say this in Ezekiel 36, 26. When we say, how can I love God that way? How can I do that? Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart, And put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone. And give you a heart of flesh. And a heart of faith. To follow him. You know why why we can love God? Why we have the ability to love God? Because God's given us a heart transplant. A new heart. Whose heart? Whose heart have we been given? The heart of Christ. Whose mind have we been given? He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in who? In Christ Jesus. But he's left it to us. To what? To dig that up and to fertilize it and cultivate it. 
and be in the scriptures so that what? The mind can be renewed. All of these things that we're going to be talking about, God wants to have take place in our lives. I want to, I can't see the clock, I'm sorry, but I'll be done in a moment. I just want to give you some things about building an all-out love for the Lord Jesus. If you're going to have an all-out love for the Lord Jesus, an all-out heart for the Lord Jesus, all of this, listen, number one, you need to develop a passion for purity. A passion for purity. So if you're out walking on the trail and some floozy comes by, you turn your eyes in a different direction. Why? Because you want to build an all-out love for the Lord Jesus Christ, a passion for the Lord. You're going to determine to do that. Matthew 5 says, Blessed are the pure in heart. What's the reward of that? For they shall see God. You want to see God every day in your life? Then develop a pure heart. A passion for purity. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3 says, speaking of the second coming and those that love is appearing, every man that hath his hope in him does what? He purifies himself even as he is pure. You get on your knees and you ask God, Lord, help me to purify my heart. And you do the things that he leads you to do to develop a pure heart. Titus 2.3 says, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of a great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who's looking for that blessed hope today? You know, the fact is, not many. It's a sad day when most Christians say, yeah, I want to go to heaven someday, but not yet. Maybe it's because I'm getting older, but I'm looking forward to being with Jesus. We were talking at a meeting the other night, and somebody brought up about getting a defibrillator for the church. In case somebody, you know, passed out, we'd give them a shock and bring them back. I looked at them and I said, you do that to me, I might sue you <laughs> for bringing me back. <laughs> I want to be with Jesus. Every Christian ought to have that longing in their heart just to be with the Lord. And I'm not saying it's wrong to revive somebody or that. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Passion for purity. A passion for people. If you're going to love God, love what? Love people. With all your heart. Love them as yourself. Luke 19.10, Jesus Christ said what? I have come to seek and to say that which was lost. Can our passion be anything less than that? If we're going to love them with all our heart and love people? As we want people to love us. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not, suffer, not, not willing that any should perish, but he's what? He's long-suffering. Can I be anything less than that if I'm going to love him with all my heart? Thirdly, we need a passion to please him, to, to gain his approval of the way that I'm living my life. I want to hear when I step out in eternity before him those words, well done, good end. Faithful servant. Bob, you want to hear that? Absolutely. More than getting the doctorate that you got? Absolutely. We want God's approval in our lives. It means everything. First, First Corinthians 4, 5 says, Therefore judge nothing before its time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall everyone have praise of God. Well, I'm hanging on to that one. Everyone's going to have some praise from God. He's going to find something to be able to praise about us. Fourthly, a passion to see Him praised and exalted. To see God worshipped. To want to gather together to worship and praise God. Ought to be at the very heart of what we are as God's people. There ought to be a heart cry for God's glory. And to want to be a part of glorifying Him. Fifthly, a passion for his presence. A passion for the presence of God daily in your life. Psalm 27, 4 says, one thing. Not ten things, not two things, not three things. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. 
every day, passion of our hearts, of our lives. Psalm 63, the psalmist said, Oh Lord, early will I seek thee. Are you doing that? Do you seek God? It's one of the first things you think of when you get out of bed in the morning. My, he says, my soul searches for you. My flesh longs for you. Listen, develop a passion for prayer. Because <laughs> listen, I can get so busy at times that a day can go by and I'll come home sometimes for supper and my wife will say, we haven't talked all day. And that hurts her, right? You understand that? Or I get hurt if she doesn't talk to me. How do you think God feels if we don't care about prayer and talking with him and, and expressing ourselves before the Lord? Listen, i I got to run through this, but we need to talk with God. David, a man after God's own heart, <laughs> says that he cried unto the Lord aloud. Find a place where you can talk to God aloud. <laughs> now, if you're walking down the trail and you're talking to himself... Did you know you can get away with that today? Because everybody assumes you got something stuck in your ear and you're talking to somebody. <laughs> Find a place where you can talk with God and cry out. First Chronicles 28, 9 says, Serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches, listen, the Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind your thoughts. God searches. That's the NIV translation of that and I want you to know you can't fake God out <laughs> he knows whether it's genuine or not he knows even the motivations of the heart S Psalm 3 verse 4 David says to the Lord I cry aloud and he answers me from his holy hill I cry what I cry aloud talk out loud to God I know you can do it in your mind you can do it all kinds of ways I think it'll do something for you to cry out loud Talk to God about your feelings. Because I know some people say, well, what would I talk to him about? Talk about your feelings. Tell him what you're feeling. Tell him what difficulties, what hurts you got going on in your life. Talk to God about your weaknesses. Now, I know you don't have any weaknesses. You know, like, I won't call any names. I'd embarrass somebody. But talk with God about the weaknesses in your lives. We hate to have our weaknesses exposed, but let's be willing to expose them before God. Talk to God about his strengths. That's what I loved about a couple of songs this morning that were talking about who God is, how great he is. Why? Because sometimes we're like those guys in the Old Testament that went into the promised land and came back and says, we can't take it because we're like grasshoppers in their sight. We think we're grasshoppers when we lose sight of how great and impressive and marvelous God is. So learn and talk to yourself and get in the scriptures and find passages that talk about the glory of the Lord and the power of God and the greatness of the Lord. Psalm 29 uh, says this, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The what? The voice of God. There's all kinds of things you can think of to begin to praise God for. Pour your heart out to God and express your desires to God. Talk to him about the things you're desiring. Talk to him about the wrong things you're desiring and help you not to desire them. Talk to him about having, helping you to develop the right desires in your heart and in your life. Talk to God about your fears, the things that you're afraid of. Bring those things openly to God. Most importantly, be willing to admit your sins to God. Because what? Sin can get between you and God, can it? Your sins, he says in Isaiah 59, have separated between you and your God. I'm not talking about losing your salvation, but you can feel totally distant from him if there's sin going on in your life and you're not dealing with it. So talk with God. Build a relationship with the Lord. Well, I, I'm going to stop. Somebody should have said amen right there. <laughs> I want to say this after all I've said. I don't know if the praise team's coming or not. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know. Jesus looked at a man that heard basically what we heard this morning. And he said, you are not far from God. 
But not far isn't enough, is it? Are you willing to become a follower of Jesus Christ? To make, yes, a decision, but a commitment as well to Jesus Christ. To follow him. To acknowledge that you're a sinner who needs his sins forgiven. That Christ is the one that came and paid the penalty for your sins. So he's the only one that can offer you forgiveness of your sins. He can wipe them out of your life and make the slate clean. He gives you his righteousness so you have a right standing before a holy God. He's prepared a home in heaven for you. But you've got to receive it, don't you? And I'm asking you today. Put your hope, faith, trust in Christ. You say, I don't fully understand all that means. Listen. I would love after this service to be able to go aside with you, just open up our Bible, five, ten minutes, I'll try to answer your questions. I won't force you to make any kind of a decision, but if God's speaking to you today, don't rush out that door. This is a decision that holds eternity, your eternity, before you. Choose Jesus. Choose Christ. Let's stand.